Yeah, thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, as Elizabeth said, my name is Lauren Pictel, and I'm one of the managers of engagement at the Indiana Historical Society. Um, one of my roles is to uh, connect our guests and members to uh, genealogy research and how the Indiana Historical Society does that is we call ourselves Indiana Storyteller. Um, and so while you might go to the Indiana State Library or Indiana State Archives or Allen County Public Library or any of the other family history libraries or centers or historical societies across the, uh, the state in the various counties, um, a lot of folks love coming to us because we have some of the juicier details that come down to uh, telling your family story or a greater way to just really deep dive into some historical context in manuscript collections. And so as Elizabeth said, the conversation that we do with Let's Talk do not include handouts. Um, this kind of iteration of these programs started way back in 2020 um, and grew throughout 2021 and into 2022 as just a place for us to talk around a topic of research and give you guys space to ask questions. Um, so us as hosts, we don't come in with prepared materials at all. So that's why there's not a handout because we wanna be here to answer your questions or talk about the topic. So you walk out like, hey, I just learned this new thing. Um, so please feel free to search links yourself and put those in the chat around what we're talking about. We'll be doing the same. Um, this is supposed to just be an informal kind of conversation. Um, so yeah, talking about labor union. Yeah, this is your chance to, you know, ask questions, share resources. Uh, we're, we're a little loosey-goosey uh, during programs like this one, uh, but that makes it kind of fun. It gives us a chance to interact with you guys more, uh, more than we would during like a traditional program. So I see a couple people have put in the chat where they're from. That's great. I love to see where people are visiting from. Since this program tonight, we're going to talk about labor unions uh, and work and things like that. Uh, how about, I'm going to ask you guys to be interactive with me. Uh, if any of you have a profession in your family that multiple people in a family did this one thing, like work in a sawmill or um, maybe work in a garment factory, why don't you put that in the chat and share that with us? Uh, we like to see things like that. And uh, if you have questions for us, you use the Q&A box for that. We will keep an eye on the chat, but sometimes, you know, things get buried in the chat. Uh, so if you have resources to share, use the chat for that. Questions for in the Q&A box. All right, so I see one person said, a shoe factory in a saloon. Saloons are fun, great. Steel workers and teamsters, auto workers. Great. Coal miners. Yeah, for sure. Um, a lot of my paternal relatives worked in the auto industry, railroads, teamsters, truck drivers, postmasters. Uh, my mother's father and both of her brothers worked for the Great Northern Railroad. Cool. Yeah. Railroads. I like, yeah. Um, I like to see, depending on... <laughs> depending on steel or railroad or um, some of these like transportation industries. And it, it, it'd be curious to also know where your family, like where your family's from. Cause I, I yeah. would assume we would start, start to see some heavy patterns. So yes, we are currently coming to you live from the state of Indiana, which had a lot of steel industry up, you know, along other um, Lake Michigan, but I, my family and I are all from central Pennsylvania and I have generations of steel workers in my family, but they end around the time that um, the steel mills of Gary, Indiana got really strong. And so like, yeah. that's, it's one of those interesting things to see um, where and all that fun stuff. Yeah. But yes, Teamsters, Rail and steel workers from Ohio and PA, that makes complete sense. Yeah. I'm seeing theme here. That's mm -hmm. great. Farmer and Labor's Union yep. in Kentucky. Cool. I also nice. appreciate the person that dropped in education in here. Um, yeah, because um, we were kind of, okay, Becky Shadix, you and I need to talk because like all of my family's from Bedford County. <laughs> <laughs> I'll send you messages later. Um, education, because we were just talking about before we opened this up, Elizabeth and I, about 
what we consider and what professions we think about when we talk about labor. Um, because the list of people that we're seeing here are all, you know, factory, heavy yeah. manual labor. Um, not saying that education's not hard because we certainly know that's not the truth. It's a but different that's a type different of job. Yeah. yeah. And in yeah. my family, I would say those those legacy professions are certainly education, steel working, steel work, working. There's some railroad and um, farmers. So, uh, one thing that's kind of interesting uh, for those of you who mentioned um, uh, ancestors being in like auto worker professions um, uh, or in a union of that sorts. The UAW is a union that present day represents a lot of library, li not just library, uh, museum and cultural institution unions present day, which is kind of interesting. The UAW, the United Auto Workers, but that's something that they do. Uh, when I previously worked at the Tenement Museum, uh, we were able to vote in our union. It was much needed. Um, this was their third union drive. Uh, the first two were squashed for a couple of reasons that I won't get into, uh, but the, who represents them is the UAW, uh, which is I find kind of interesting. But I kind of feel like when you're when you're kind of talking about you know the history of just working in this country, uh, especially when we get to the turn of the century, it I mean it, it very is closely aligned with talking about the rights of the workers. Yeah, and so that's why we're all here today. Um, I do see a, something in the Q and A. Yeah, um, that might be something that you and your team, Elizabeth, can dig into, just because you have a farther reach outside of Indiana than I do. <laughs> um, yeah. The question really? is a, is about union movements um, in the Seattle area and resources. Okay, so really interested in resources getting info from the 1900 to 1925 time frame in Seattle area and the union movement, particularly shipping, carpentry, and marine unions during that time frame. Uh, my grandfather was involved early on in the shipwrights union going on from 1907 through the 20s. So here's the thing about placing your family within, within a union. Uh, if you know that they're involved in the union, great. Um, there are a couple of like best practices for doing like incorporating that labor union like research into your genealogy. Uh, first would be to research the organization over the individual. So it's more likely that a local newspaper would report on the events of and activities of the organization versus reporting on the individual member. So research broad is kind of what I'm saying. Um, and you want to consider the history of the organization within the larger part of the history of the country and then the state and then the local level. So again, big, and then you kind of narrow down from there. So if you're looking for an organization that might not exist anymore, because you know a lot of these unions, they would crop up, uh, especially in the time frame that you're talking about, early 1900s. Uh, into the 20s, they can crop up and then they die. Uh, happened all the time. So you wanna see where those records might've ended up. Uh, if they survive, they oftentimes end up in manuscript collections. You can find those in local archives and universities, sometimes even in like private libraries, private collections. So dig into those local resources. Those are gonna be your best resources to dig into. Um, and just know that a lot of it is not online. <laughs> it's just, some of it is, but a lot of like the meat is not online. So like I did research several years ago when writing my thesis for my first master's on uh, the Knights of Labor, which is a fascinating group for a lot of many reasons. Um, a lot of the Knights of Labor stuff I found in the New York University Library. So NYU's library and also the New York Public Library, I found a lot of stuff there. Um, so you wanna kind of dig into those 
university libraries and those archives seem very confined them, but none of that stuff was online. None of it. Yeah, I hope that was helpful. Is <laughs> like have a checklist of things to to do and to consider. I would also say, talk about. yeah, beyond like kind of understanding the places that you need to to look for and kind of what sort of records to get a feeling for that. Um, I always tell people when in doubt, contact someone locally. Yeah. So, you know, um, reach out to the Washington State Historical Society, reach out to um, county historical societies that would be around those areas where those industries were located and just say, this is what you're looking for. Do you know who I should be speaking to? Everyone will be help, happy and helpful to, to put you in that direction. Um, and sometimes I like to do that first rather than stick around because it eliminates a lot of time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, you... and, and the, as we know, like when, when businesses close, when organizations close, um, there is no rhyme or reason where to where those collections go to most of the time. Um, we, it, you know, especially when you're talking about something, it could have been that someone just from the county just randomly had that in their home as a private collection when those things ended um, or that they were secretary and they didn't, don't have an office, they pass away, whoever's in charge of their estate, they don't really know what they're looking at to know where to go. So if they, if they were kept and survived, it's, it's often hit or miss where those will end up. You hope they end up at a level appropriate for like what their reach is, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they do. So especially when it comes to what we would call with this kind of thing, like a manuscript collection or a records collection that's not unique to vital records, that's industry basic, it's university, yeah. it's historical society, it's random like yeah. libraries. So just always reach out and ask because it'll be different everywhere. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, as you said, you know, a lot of these organizations, you know, they come and they go, I mean, and also they change names too. Mm -hmm. uh, they might be called something different. Or someone else bought them out. They were absorbed yeah. 14 yeah. times and then wherever yeah. they end up is where they end up. I like, like I, Jane Rollins in the, in the chat just said that she found a members list for a cartoonist union um, local from Westchester County, New York, but it was at the California State University in yeah. Northridge, California. Yeah. One, a cartoonist union sounds awesome. Right? I feel yeah. like their like meetings would be really interesting. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, Can you imagine yeah. someone just like doing a sketch at the meeting in a corner? Yeah, like they do for a court yeah pieces. yeah it would be fun <laughs> that would be cool that would be very cool but yeah that's an excellent point you know a really good example of something that is not where you would expect it to be so you end up having to like i said research broad research broad um so one person asked in the q a if someone worked in the railroad, I think in the 1940s, will there be some sort of record? It depends on the railroad company. Um, send us an email and we can talk more about it. Uh, we can give you some ideas of maybe where those records might live uh, and where, if they have survived and where you might be able to find them. So send us an email. Our email is genealogy at acpl.info. I'm gonna put that in the chat. My son-in-law was in the cartoonist union in California. He worked for Warner Brothers in Disney. That's really Oh cool. my gosh. That's, really That's fun. fun facts about me. I originally went to school for art, art education. Little little me is AKA me right now to you. Is very excited about this for you. That is so exciting. Is there a genealogy union? You know, if only someone would just the closest like for our would, rights <laughs> right. I would think the closest would be was like an organization that kind of the the, the, the the board certification yeah so or just, a yeah, but yeah. That's, that's different but it's not the same I would it's not the same I would think the prop it depends on the angle that you're trying to take 
because I, I would almost feel like it needs to be like an archivist librarian bent rather yeah. than genealogist because it's funds and protections for those yeah. caring for the objects and the genealogists are just a different level. Um, Seattle General Strike of 1919 was a five day general work stoppage by more than 65,000 workers in the city of Seattle. Woo, from that's a lot. February 6th through 11th to satisfy workers and several unions began the strike and uh, to gain higher wages after two years of wage controls during World War II. So someone commented that they're unsure about what information they could release, but their railroad retirement board was the counterpart of social security for railroad workers. So it's a lot of social security account data that appears yeah. on answer three, but not about railroad. That's a good point. Um, I also think with some of these larger collections, you might get um, basically a list of people's names, but you might not get more than that. And that's yeah. when your social history, historical context brain needs to really turn on to know that once the, when it, you might ever only know that they were a part of a union because it was listed in their obituary and you kind of have to take that with a grain of salt or found, you know, a pin yeah. or something in a collection. Um, but then you just kind of need to do the research to figure out what was their job, where were they, what, what movements. So like if someone was working um, during the general, working out in, in Seattle area in 1919, do you think that they participated in this five day, 65,000 worker strike? And then to understand what that was like, that tells you a lot about that person. Would you look at court records to strikes? If someone was arrested, maybe. I mean, you can look and see. Yeah. Um, you can look and see if maybe there's some type of from a court thing that happened. Um, so for before court records for for strikes, I would just do newspapers. Heavily. Yeah, newspapers are your friend for sure. And for for the days leading up to and like weeks later, because. Yeah. You, you want to see um, who is who is maybe getting arrested after the fact or, you know, they were, were questioned at their job later or um, there was a follow up of businesses actually making changes or laws that were changed locally or statewide from those strikes. The newspapers are going to going to tell you all about that. Well, a good example of that the Haymarket affair also called the Haymarket massacre, Haymarket riot, Haymarket square incident, uh, all of the above. Uh, for those who are not familiar with it, that was a labor demonstration that started as a peaceful rally. This was in 1886, I believe, in Chicago. And it, what the people were protesting, they were demanding the eight hour workday. It ended in a massacre. <laughs> it ended really badly. Um, Basically, there were a number of anarchists who were convicted of conspiracy. It was a whole thing. That incident, that had a ripple effect across the country when it comes to the unions, when it comes to you know, anyone suspected of anarchy. Um, it changed how uh, certain religious groups will interact with the unions. So for example, um, uh, if you were a Catholic, if you join certain unions, uh, you were, you could potentially be uh, uh, excommunicated uh, because there was this, you know, fear that you're going to get too close to anarchism, right? Um, and they kept talking about the, the Haymarket affair for years afterwards. Uh, so look in the paper, like Lauren suggested, in at least like before and after so of announcements saying oh this group is going to have a protest on this day um you can see some of the positive or negative press around that and then look at after look at what happened after and kind of go from there newspapers are definitely your friend for that um some of them more interesting like li like labor union records so that i've seen for a actual union 
uh, were unfortunately not an American union. Um, it was for the Irish Women's Workers Union. There is a labor archive in Dublin uh, where they have all this labor history stuff. And it's it's really, it's, it's a gold mine, but it is so poorly organized. I mean, y'all, I think I still have nightmares about that archive, I'm not gonna lie. Um, it was, how do I explain this? The labor union archive was kind of like, a, almost in a, like a two-story house type structure. And they would keep the files in one of the upstairs rooms and you were on the first floor, like in a reading room of sorts. They had three different catalogs that were kind of blended together in a bizarre way, which is, I can't, I can't even talk about that. It hurts. Uh, but usually when you go look at a manuscript collection, you say, oh, I want to look at these folders. The folders weren't actually numbered. They gave you the box and then you just had to dig through the box. Yeah, yeah. that's, uh. It's so frustrating. It hurts my happen. soul. Yeah. And it's, but they had great stuff. They had the right. meeting minutes. <laughs> this is one of those moments that I was like gonna get on a soapbox for a minute where museums and library archives are often the individuals who are caring for these objects. Yeah. Um our Allen County Public Library is its own separate. <laughs> magical thing and how it's funded um but when it's not a state organization or it's not attached to a county you're often talking about a private nonprofit. and yeah. in the case of the indiana historical society we are not attached to the state um funding helps to get jobs it helps to be able to have enough people to work with enough volunteers it's not enough to just say we need more volunteers to get things digitized and metadata and have yeah. the people to organize the boxes appropriately so that people can search them yeah. for years onward. So if you have the means to right. help uh, any archive or organization seriously, whether it's adopt a collection, adopt part of a collection, come in in person and dedicate your time to that, adopt in a financial sense, please do, because as a profession, our funding continues to, to get cut and the consequences are unfortunately reflected in yeah. accessing records and digitization and that's just what it is. Yeah, and in the absence of being able to contribute monetarily, um, when you're looking through those records, just be aware that they're doing the best they can. Uh, mm -hmm. I, that particular labor archive for Ireland, that was run by the Irish government. So it was supposed to be like federally funded, but their funding had been cut year after year because they weren't associated with the National Archives or the National Library. It was just three older gentlemen who have been there for like 40 years just trying to keep it alive. But I mean- right very few people even knew it existed. Uh, I knew it existed because I saw a citation in a book, which is another thing. If you're looking for records for certain groups, um, read those, start, read, you know, journal articles, read books about unions in uh, or the labor uh, movement in a certain place, and then look at the footnotes. <laughs> Look at the citations and see what are other historians looking at. And that can give you an idea of where certain things live. Um, I So we had Marion who commented that she was told that workers in Wheeling, West Virginia refused Carnegie money to build a library and funded it with local money. They told Carnegie that he couldn't wash the blood off his hands by building libraries. That is not uncommon. Yeah. Um, I, I will say, I feel like I've read a lot of instances where you get into, it's, you know, a lot of labor scenarios is, is a poverty cycle to try to try to get out, um, especially when you start looking at company towns, 
whether it was designed as a company town that the company owned your house and everything like that is a whole is one part of that. But we all know we've seen it in recessions in Michigan with General Motors, in my hometown with um, a couple different businesses that when that business goes down, the entire town is zapped. Yeah. Um, you have so many unemployed individuals that impacts everything else. So if a company does wrong by its people, what and it's a huge swath of workers yeah. in a certain area, of course, they're going to rally together and make statements. And so, you know, understanding the monopoly that is Carnegie, um, we can't even fathom how wealthy he was, like Bezos, Musk level plus, considering today's yeah. finances, um, to understand that that kind of anger towards we need them we need their what they what they supplied but you don't want to be associated with that a good example I have in my family is um the famous the infamous Johnstown flood of Pennsylvania um Mm -hmm. you're talking about you're talking about a, a town of people who are all pretty much laborers working in steel and working in coal um and who all worked for guys like Carnegie and he was included in this and some others who had a really um, well-known like resort hunters club that had a dam for fishing um, and they continually ignored that the um, dam that itself for the reservoir up at the top of the mountain was increasingly stressed and was going to potentially cause problems and if you know the topography of Pennsylvania when something at the top of a mountain doesn't work out it rolls down and so you're talking about a giant reservoir worth of water that released and just wiped out multiple towns and just completely destroyed like tsunami level tidal wave ridiculousness um there was a woman that I used to work with who was descended from people in Johnstown was from Johnstown herself. And when you talked about this in two, when I talked to her about this in 2017, she was crying in front of me and talking about how much she hated those, those, you know, steel leaders and industry folks. That's just, that doesn't go away. And that's something that also, I I really think that it's something that continues on for multiple generations for sure. Yeah. yeah. And that was just in like late, I forget the year exactly. It was late, late 1800s, but. Um, um, for the person who is asking about Seattle, um, there is University of Washington has a labor archive for the state. Uh, they have a lib guide of what all is in the collection. I'm going to put a link to that in the chat. So my uh, Pennsylvania, Bedford County buddy, Becky, uh, just said that she read the David McCullough book on the Johnstown flood. It's it's pretty impactful and that she has not found any direct or collateral family. Um, yes, we have a first person and that corrected me that yes, it's 1889 was the flood. We have a first person account in my family of surviving the Johnstown flood. There was a handful of people in one house um, and her sister and her sister's daughter was visiting. They heard a horrible sound. The dad looked out the front window and saw like, you know, an eight foot wall of water and debris barreling down towards them. They went back into the parlor of the house. They held hands. They sat on the floor and just waited to die. Um, Some of them survived and some did not. But yeah, wow. if that's your family and you grew up there, of course you would not be happy with the wealthy business people that clearly did not care. They also, there was also long going litigation and arguments because they didn't want to pay out for expenses saying it was a natural disaster, not that um, it was negligence. Bad. Um, so what we can also ask people this in the, to share in the chat too, what do you, what's 
so this kind of moving story that I found about my family in Johnstown flood and like knowing um, what kind of profession legacies are in my family. What do we think is like the most important thing for us and why it's super important for us to look at labor records, um, understand labor movements and how that helps inform who we are today in our family? Or the cool story that you, yeah, or the <laughs> cool stories that you found that really like, impacted you. Um, just thinking of why it was so poignant for me to find that John Soundflood piece. Well, I think that workers' rights and just understanding the history of the workers' rights uh, and why certain laws exist that we have today regarding, you know, the eight-hour workday. Right. Um, these are things that, if it wasn't for people protesting, if it wasn't for people dying in fires like the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire in New York, we would not have these things today. Uh, I think about that every time uh, a colleague reminds me, you haven't taken your break yet today. Mm -hmm. uh, and someone actually said to me, women did not march in the streets for you to not take a break. <laughs> uh, it's, it's not just, it informs on how we kind of live our daily lives today, but also, um, you know, where our family fits into the bigger story. Uh, if you, you know, we've talked about a lot about not just looking at the names and the dates and the locations. That's all great, right? When we're doing genealogy research, but being able to fit our family story within a bigger context gives them life again. Uh, it adds color to the story. Uh, I think that's really important. And it gives us some insight into what did their work day look like? Uh, you know, for someone who is a 15 year old girl working in a garment factory in New York, what did that look like? Look up the labor laws of the time. We know how long she was working in a day. We know what the factory conditions looked like. Um, and we could also see that there are gonna be other girls her age protesting. Is she one of them? We don't know that for sure. Uh, not necessarily, but she could be. So those are things that kind of, like I said, they just kind of add to the story. Um, one person said, anyone who works a 40 hour week today should be grateful for the sacrifices union members made hundred plus years ago because previously they were working 50, 60 hour week, weeks. Yeah. I appreciate you saying about like teenage girls. I think I, yes, about the hours that we work and having yeah. um, appropriate hours to somewhat try to have a work-life balance sanitary struggle. conditions safe conditions yeah breaks yeah. um you know having access to restrooms and water and ventilation yeah. and um what employers are required to post all sorts of stuff but I often think about this just with like child labor yeah. um first before, like I mean yeah. you can talk about newsies and everything else but um when I was last year was doing a deep dive into some of the work conditions in Gary, Indiana, um, in the communities there and the steel mills there. Um, that included work conditions around schools and the uniqueness of Gary's school systems and what they were trying to do. Um, and there were certain paragraphs that I had to frequently put down because it was just a lot to handle. And one was that to try to better educate their students, they had to employ a system of police officers chasing down students who weren't attending school. And oh, the, the arguments, truancy officers. Yeah, thank you for that word. Was yeah. struggling to find it. Um, and so to the truancy officers, then getting into arguments with their parents because their children, was, their children were working instead of coming to school. And then to hear testimonies of, family members being like, but the fines are still less, the amount of money we get back are still less money than paying the fines than if our children only went to school and didn't work. Yeah. So, so like 
how much income they were losing. They were already on the poverty level. You are already dealing with horrific health conditions, like community health conditions, people living stacked on top of each other. There's a reason why the Muckrakers and the Jungle by Upton Sinclair happened and is a book that we still tell people to read. It's, those are the things I think about. So, I was looking for a statistic, okay. Um, so for those of you who might have attended some of my programs before where I've mentioned that I used to work at the Tenement Museum in New York, uh, one of the tours we gave on a regular basis was called the Sweatshop Workers Tour. You can guess what that tour was about. Uh, even though the tours weren't scripted, um, we often talked about uh, the role of work in two specific families' lives who, these were families that were real, they lived in that building, uh, which was 97 Orchard. Uh, and so we would talk about the garment industry and what the relationship was with the family and work. And oftentimes the kids and the mothers in particular, what their relationship was with this entire work situation. Um, and one of the statistics that I was just looking up to make sure I knew what the exact numbers were that we used to tell people was that in 1910, the US Immigration Commission found that in more than any other group, any other immigrant group, Russian Jews depended on the income of their children, whereas foreign born families in general derived 21% of their household income from children's work. 21% of just a household income was coming from their kids working of any immigrant group. Uh, for Russian Jewish children, that was 30.7% 30, 30 in 1910. Uh, that's, that's a big percentage uh, of your kids uh, of relying on that income. And in that same time frame, uh, in New York at least, you were only required to go to school like 70 days out of the year or 72 days out of the year. So even if you didn't have official working papers that allowed you to leave school and then go work, these kids had side hustles all the time um, just to help bring in money to help pay for just life. <laughs> yeah. Um, Unions are the reason the Catholic Church came out with their canon on social justice and the ability to join a group that kept members secret. Beginning of the unions in the, in the United States. Yeah. Uh, I believe the Knights of Labor was one of those ones because it was a secret society originally uh, that Catholics were not really supposed to be joining, but they were joining anyway. Uh, in fact, one of the... That all from their Catholic social teaching? Yeah. Like family, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, I know one of the more important leaders of the Knights of Labor, his name is uh, Terrence Powderly. Terrence Powderly was Irish American and he was involved in some fun secret society Irish nationalist groups. I could do a whole other presentation on that, but he was he was doing all kinds of things behind closed doors uh, for Irish America. It's great stuff. Um, okay. We have a question um, from Phyllis in the chat that said that she has no idea if any of her family are in a union except for me, one great uncle. Um, but she knows that the rest of her family are all laborers, but have not found anything about unions. So how would you go about finding out if someone was in a union if all you know was they were a laborer? Look to see if there were unions in the area, in the time frame. That's what I would do first, because member lists are hard to find. Um, so start with the newspaper search in the newspaper in that time frame for whatever type of profession it was, steel mill, sawmill, railroad, whatever, and search union with it and see if you could see anything about union activity in the area. That's where I would start um, because you might not find something that says, yes, this person was in this union. 
but you can kind of see they might have been in the union um, if they were a part of this profession. This one union was big in the area. So, yeah, if that makes sense. That's great. That's an excellent point, Jane. Thank you for bringing this up. Labor unions were often listed in city directories in the front or in the back. Yes, they were. Yeah. Uh, if for some reason we're talking about a place that doesn't have a city directory or a county directory, go to the newspaper. Yeah. And again, I would say if you know they worked and lived in, an, in a certain area, then contact that historical society, county historical society, local area, and just say, hey, I know this, this person lived in this area and did this for, 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 for profession. Sorry. Um, do you know the, any unions that were attached to this in the area? Yeah, that's excellent advice. I'm just reading this statement from someone about the Pope. That's, yeah, that's a really important point because, you know, one thing that would discourage some people from joining unions would be fear of excommunication. So it's good that the church kind of, you know, changed their mind on that. Um, but yeah, that's something to also to consider. Now, that's not to say that just because somebody is Catholic doesn't mean that they didn't join a union anyway. Um, because if you are the one person in your group not joining the union, that could be bad. That could be bad. There could be repercussions for that. And also nobody likes scab. Yeah. Right. For sure. I love all the sharing about your own family stories happening in the chat. This is great. So has, is anyone in one of those professional, like profession legacies in your own family? Have you or have you maybe done that as a, a side or summer job at one point? Um, it wasn't until after I was done working in this job um, and was started working in libraries and archives and uh, working in genealogy that I kind of made this connection and thought how cool it was. Um, but to have a lot of people in my family who were farmers, um, I grew up in farm country. I'm from central Pennsylvania. I'm from such a small area in central Pennsylvania that our traffic were Amish buggies. That was it. Um, and I worked on a dairy farm for six, six years during the summer. Um, and it wasn't until I was done with that that I made the connection of like, oh, I have this experience that some of my immediate family members um, in my generation and around my generation do not as a connection to previous generations. Like, I know how hard it is and how hot it is to do different things that someone who doesn't live through that experience would not know. But just thought it'd be interesting to see if we've made connections within what we do for a living or what we've, we've done at different times. Someone worked in a mine in Montana in 1974. I can't imagine working, it was, if this was a cool mine, I can't imagine that kind of work, what that does on your lungs. I know, even for just I, a summer. Yeah, I can't imagine copper mine even still oof. Uh, was the one mine collapse was it in wales it was in an episode of the crown yes that was in this that was in wales i don't remember what kind of mine it was was it coal or was it copper Dang. it was something um Kelsey Evans asked, were any unions associated with lead and zinc mining in Oklahoma? So for those of you who have attended our programs before, you have might have heard this expression, Google's your friend. Uh, I, I Googled it, literally. Um, mm -hmm. The Oklahoma Historical Society, they had this page on the Tri-State Lead and Zinc District. They did not favor unions and rarely conducted strikes, at least until the depression. So it depends on the time frame you're asking about. Um, but it looks like unions were kind of slow to really gain a lot of traction in that area. But for that type of 
those types of minds. But considering the fact that the Oklahoma Historical Society has a page specifically about this, I would maybe contact them and ask like, hey, uh, what more do you know about this? Always, always go local. See, see what the people who have boots on the ground happen to just know. Yes, the um, Aberfen disaster in Wales um, was coal and it impacted a village of 8,000 coal workers. Oof. From 1966. It killed 116 children and 28 adults. Oh, wow. This uh, Jane had a pen pal who lived in Aberfan during the slag heap collapse. What I'd be here, what they shared with you, I just can't even imagine. Yeah, I can't imagine either. That's intense. Because that's what like, I mean, you hear I about guess... these. Well, you hear right. about these mining accidents from like long ago where like a ton of people die, right? Or um, like, or it's just, or it's, um, like a certain part of the mine collapse and you know a handful of people are, are killed. Yeah. But I can't I cannot imagine losing that happening. almost 200 people in one town. Yeah. Especially that it she had a school friend that died. Wow. Yeah, because it yeah. took out a, it took out a school. That's right. Yeah. Oof. Disasters. Yeah, they're everywhere. So in our maybe in our last 15 minutes, let's talk about some of the funny jobs we found. <laughs> 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 or jobs that you think that would be that's funny. That would I, I, I don't understand how this is a profession. Like well, I vaguely remember seeing a union for a cl- for like clowns. I mean, we learned about cartoonist unions today. Yeah, that's it wouldn't amazing. surprise me if there was a clown union. Um, which you know is the stuff of nightmares kind of terrified of clowns but no um clown if they have a in their clown union they need a they need a pr makeover because clowns are supposed to bring people joy but thank you like stephen king and it and everybody else who just ruined that for how many people i my fear of clowns is from childhood but that that's that is for a therapist to work out (laughs) um Wait, so Russ, was your dad a clown? No, 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 no. He's saying that his uh, his dad's oh, is a was striking. Um, then the UMWA striking put his dad out of work for 18 months. Yeah, so you're going to have people, while unions are very important to like the rights of, of workers, importance of the history of the country, um, you are going to have a certain degree of corruption in unions as well with any group of organizations. You are going to have that. Um, not saying that that particular, I don't know the context of that particular event to say, oh, this was a corruption thing. I have no idea. But you are, that is going to, if it's affecting your family personally, you're going to have feelings about it. And those feelings are valid. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so, we don't see any more questions in the Q&A. Idaho Silver Valley marks 40 years since the Sunshine Mine disaster. Oh. In Kellogg, Idaho, 91 men died in carbon. No baseball strike. I don't know anything about that. Aberfin disaster. And like, that's just such a high volume of people. And then just thought to try to wrap my brain around that in relationship to Johnstown flood because that's the research I've been in um, and just realized that for the Johnstown flood that killed almost 8% of the town's population. So I think sometimes when we're talking about these disasters, it's important to understand in the Aberfin one, Yes, it took out a school and that's going to hit much differently. It also happened in the in 1966. So it became global right away. But when looking at historic ones, take in account the rate of communication. Um, 
and those percentages to understand how deep and long that pain will probably last. The website I was thinking of was called gendisasters.com. Mm. I think that their website is having some problems though. So I'm not gonna put it in the chat because it's like not loading. So their website might be down, but I'm gonna put a link to an article called uh, five tips for Ooh. researching disasters in your family history. So we're about out of time. Uh, I don't see any more questions, but if you guys have questions, comments, concerns, if you'd like a copy of the chat, any or all of the above, send us an email. Our email is genealogy at acpl.info. I just put it in the chat. Um, yeah, well, thanks for joining us for this Let's Talk ses session with Lauren Pechtel from the Indiana Historical Society. As always, thank you, Lauren, for joining us. Yeah, it's thank you. A great time, even though we're ending on a kind of a dark note. But, you know, this genealogy, yeah. we're kind of dark people. Maybe before we say goodbye to everyone, we should talk about something we're excited about researching. So just kind of like yes, individually. Everyone. And someone put put what you're excited about researching in the chat. We want to leave you being inspired with other things to, you know. Or something that you to. recently found that you're excited right, exactly. about. Put that in but the chat and, so, so it's a little less depressing. Go for it, Elizabeth. What are, what are you what are you working on or excited to be working on? Uh, I don't know if anyone else would be excited about this. I've been um, for an upcoming program at the end of this month. Uh, I'm doing a program on doing house history. So if you're interested in that, awesome. that is, oh God, what day is that? I don't even remember. That's towards the end of the month, which I can show you guys where to find our upcoming programs while I'm talking. I was doing research kind of in preparation for this program on house history. And I was able to trace the history of my house back to the original family that own the land that my house currently sits on because my house was built in 1900 so I'm super excited anyway um and if you come for the September 27th leaving the farm that's with my colleague Amy Vedra director of library services here yes so we have all these reference services yeah wonderful programs coming up uh on Tuesday we have exploring Miss, uh, Missouri Roots so things available through, I believe this is through the state. No, this is just, this is somebody named Ginger, Ginger Brickley, who is a expert at the Jefferson County Library in Missouri. So this should be fun. Cool. And then we will have a guide to the DAR library, which we always have a lot of DAR applicants who are emailing us, asking us for help, panicking, uh, leaving the farm. So that'll be on Tuesday, September 27th. You know, as Lauren just said, the wonderful Amy Vedra will be giving a program for us. This should be a lot of fun. Then... Oh, fun stuff coming out of your attendees. Someone found a photo from 1890 of their great uncle in California who was in the Mexican-American War. The pick of soldiers who fought in the war was taken in Sacramento, and he and his brother were in the picture in their uniform. And then Russ shared that he's working on trying to find someone with ground penetrating radar to scan a mystery grave. That's exciting. Very cool. Um, I am looking, I've being in public programming at the IHS, you have to research a little bit of everything. <laughs> um, so I know some of my teammates were researching how to make realistic uh, looking blood um, for an upcoming program called Who Done It, which is a murder mystery where we research a real historic Indiana murder and uh, turn it into a live action clue game that you can come and ask questions and solve with some of our actors, which is fun. Um, and then some of my research spans pretty much a little bit of everything recently Indiana eugenics laws um, and uh, what kind of went into, uh, I guess, homes, I'm 
losing my thought for the word homes for people with different mental illnesses or disabilities. Um, and then um, I've also been doing a, a much deeper dive into native peoples of the Ohio River Valley and Great Lakes regions for some upcoming programming as well. Awesome. Cool. Thanks everybody for sharing and thank you for joining us. And yeah, thank you guys. Great questions and, and stories yeah. as always. Awesome. Thank you for Bridget for sharing that kind of last statement. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I hope everyone has a good night. And like I said, if you have more questions, things you want to share with us, uh, if you'd like a copy of the chat, send us an email. I'm putting it in the chat one more time, but it's genealogy at ACPL.info. All right. Well, have a good night, everybody. See ya. Bye.